Hey guys, are you ready for this? All right, I'll just throw out that disclaimer while I'm waiting for everyone who's gonna join to join. Remember, nothing we talk about today is medical advice. Um, it's not to treat or diagnose or prescribe. We're simply discussing health and we are um, talking about things that should educate you and inspire you to go further your own research. I couldn't possibly know everything that's going on um, in your individual case or anything like that. So um, it's just, you know, remember when we're talking about information to take that information and then apply it to your own individual case and what's going on with you. Hello, hello, hello. It's so good to see everybody. I am so excited. Um, hey, any ideas what causes lichen sclerosis? You know, I have noticed uh, a connection with estrogen um, because, you know, it tends to get worse at certain times of the cycle. It tends to um, be, uh, I, I do think it has a, at least partially a role um, or a cause with estrogen. Estrogen is, is going to be a driving factor, but I do think it also has to do with di the digestive tract, obviously. Um so whenever it comes to any type of skin condition or anything like that, I'm always looking towards uh, um, some multiple things. So we always got to look towards heavy metals. We always have to look towards improving detoxification. We've always got to look at hormone levels, um, estrogen levels, because remember estrogen doesn't always hang out in the bloodstream. That's going to be a carrier for hormones. It likes to stick around in the tissues and the organs. And so a lot of times people are struggling with uh, issues that are being driven by estrogen, but they don't really know that because their blood levels are normal or their blood levels are even low. And so I always think of estrogen as a factor and other kind of stress slash um, growth hormones like prolactin and um, ACTH and things like that. So I always take an approach to everything kind of the same way because regardless of what we're struggling with it always boils down to a few things it's improper nourishment which is causing uh, an overload on the digestive tract and then therefore causing um, overload of endotoxin which is those which are those toxins that the bacteria in the gut are producing and then that's burning our liver and and causing stress depleting us of nutrients and then um, we always got to take a nutrition approach to make sure we are getting the right nutrients we're eating things that are going to help us move estrogen out of the system, all the while supporting detoxification through mineral balancing and possibly digging deeper into gut health. So, you know, regardless of what's, what's, um, what issue we're struggling with, it usually boils down to the same thing. Now, some people have factors that um, are affecting them more than others. For example, if you grew up eating tons and tons of iron fortified foods. Let's say you grew up on processed food diet, ate tons of um, iron fortified flours and cereals and things like that. You're iron toxic. You have toxic amounts of iron in the tissues. And regardless of if you're coming back anemic or not, you, you're iron toxic. And so iron's gonna drive oxidation, it's gonna drive lipofuscin, it's gonna drive all types of inflammation. And so in someone like that, you know, you gotta focus on iron a little more. Or let's look at maybe uh, a history of like really, really, um, you know, lots and lots of poofas. Grew up on fast food. It's fried in canola oil. Maybe you um, ate like a, tra a traditional cuisine. Stop it, Samson. Sorry, he's like, he's watching me. Um, uh, maybe some type of cuisine that it has a heavy emphasis on using canola oil or soybean oil and, and frying foods in a lot of these oils. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you, you know, things like that. So then we have to look towards PUFA, um, possible PUFA exposure and PUFA in the tissue, <coughs> polyunsaturated fats in the tissue. Remember that um, uh, being bottle fed is going to be a factor in both those things. So uh, remember that uh, baby formula has iron in it and it has polyunsaturated fats, two things that are gonna set us up for, I guess, just more of a struggle with those things I'm in the guest room. So he's like, you know, sitting on the bed watching me and then now he doesn't want to do that anymore. 
Um, so, you know, that's just one factor of many. A lot of times people have this buildup of so many different factors that are driving their issues that they didn't even realize were, were an issue. And so it's layers and layers of healing. But with lichen sclerosis, that's a long way of saying, um, I look towards estrogen, uh, possible iron and PUFA history, and then, you know, always looking at minerals, always looking at gut health, always looking at nutrition and nourishing yourself properly. Hey, I made it. Asked in a message, but not sure if you saw any info, tips on large dermoid cysts. Um, any type of growth cysts are usually going to be driven by estrogen. Remember, estrogen is a hormone of growth or cell proliferation, which is why we need a certain spike of it right before we ovulate um, and why it's elevated during pregnancy. But it does affect um, cell turnover and uh, oil production and sebum production in the skin cells and so it's going to affect that I, i've noticed a lot of women with like pcos or estrogen issues also struggle with things like uh, polynidal cysts or uh, bertholian cysts or dermoid cysts or ovarian cysts and i have to say that that observation has driven me to believe that these estrogen dominant conditions like pcos are also going to drive other growths and and uh, cysts and things like that. So, um, uh, you know, raw carrot salad, things like vitamin E, things that are going to help us move, uh, or at least utilize estrogen properly or detoxify from estrogen are going to be helpful. Um, some people, some of my clients have seen a lot of success with using castor oil packs for their cysts. Um, I personally have no, um, experience with that. So I can only kind of point you in the right direction and say, Hey, go research that. Um, and then if it's on an area where your lymph, uh, like where your lymph nodes would be like armpits, um, lymph nodes near your groin, maybe here, um, that's a really good sign that we need to support the lymph system and do lots of myofascial release, body brushing, trigger point therapy. We've got a lot of bound up fascia and tissue that is causing, um, you know, toxins to be stagnant in the body. And so uh, those are also things that we want to focus on. If we're struggling for, with cysts, we really want to focus on lymphatic, the lymphatic system and, the t and our tissue health overall. I started to eat a carrot a day now. Yay! If there's one thing that we can do for our hormones that's very, very easy is eat a raw carrot every single day. If I was intolerant to dairy, what would my symptoms be? Um, you would know, like you would not feel good all the time or have, you know, symptoms. And uh, then when you cut it out, you wouldn't have those symptoms anymore. <laughs> so, you know, there's a lot of people creating issues where issues do not belong. And it's really driving me nuts because dairy is such a high quality functional food. It provides so many fat soluble vitamins needed for detoxification and cell cellular turnover and overall hormonal health and brain health and all uh, nervous system health and then you know people are cutting it out and replacing it with this nasty process you know nut milks and nut cheeses which are just so awful for us because those fats are oxidized and so it's causing more inflammation and more issues and so uh, personally if you don't have a problem with dairy it's not causing direct symptoms it's not causing issues for you we don't need to really worry about consuming it uh, we should just consume it <laughs> What do you think about C. buckthorn oil capsules? I'm not sure, but I'm assuming those are going to be a polyunsaturated fat, DHA, maybe e e um, EHA, and I, I'm not a fan of those types of oils. Causes for congestion, I feel like I have to remove blackheads every single day. Usually that's digestive irritation. Um, you know, remember estrogen is gonna really uh, affect the sebum producing parts of our skin. And so, uh, the elimination of estrogen is going to be affected by our gut health. So a lot of people who have digestive issues, excess of estrogen, are eating continually gut irritating foods, lots of nuts, maybe lots of seeds, maybe lots of raw greens, maybe lots of um, plant fats. All of those things are going to be factors in gut irritation. And so um, usually you'll see less congestion in the skin once you uh, lower your gut irritation, get your liver functioning better, and help your body eliminate estrogen better. 
Bentonite clay masks to get aluminum buildup out of armpits for toxic deodorants. Yeah, I do those all the time. I think they're very helpful. Bentonite clay is an adsorbent, and so it actually is very good at pulling things towards itself. I do not like it internally because it does contain um, a, a, an aluminum, uh, I guess like adjuvant almost. It's what's going to happen is it's going to, um, when it hits your stomach acid, it's going to um, react with the aluminum components in bentonite clay. And then what's going to happen is you'll be able to absorb that aluminum. So I don't like bentonite clay internally, but I do like it externally for pulling heavy metals and things towards itself. Like let's say you have a lot of conventional deodorant use in your history, you know, uh, that those deodorants have aluminum in them and so when you uh, use bentonite clay mask on your armpits or near all your lymph nodes I mean you can use it toward uh, near your groin things like that it's going to pull a lot of things out of the skin and uh, it's a very very uh, successful way to do that um, the more BO we have usually the more metals are that are moving out of our body so um, we can you know up our our needs accordingly. Sometimes people will really be detoxifying at first and they're moving a lot of junk out of the armpits because their their armpits are finally allowed to sweat. And so um, they might use those bentonite clay masks a couple times a week for you know maybe four to six weeks until the stink has kind of subsided. I know you recommend chlorophyll but doesn't have too much copper. Should we do a copper blood test first? Um, personally, there are different types of chlorophylls. There are ones that are just, you know, purely copper. I personally don't think copper is a problem. I'm not worried about copper toxicity in the sense of a lot of people are like, oh my gosh, copper toxicity. But copper toxicity or copper dysregulation is oftentimes from not having a lot of bioavailable copper in your body, meaning that you maybe had a copper IUD, you were on the birth control pill, you um, drank out of copper pipes, things like that, and those th those types of copper are not bioavailable. Whereas copper in chlorophyll or copper in liver, those are things that's copper that you're actually going to absorb. And so, what a lot of people don't realize is when they're copper toxic, whatever that means, they're also copper deficient as well because they don't have enough bioavailable copper. So I'm not worried about copper in foods. I'm worried about having an excess amount of copper in your body. Um, but no, I don't think uh, the copper content in chlorophyll is a problem because I don't recommend using a ton of it. I recommend, you know, the serving size, which is a, a teaspoon or a tablespoon. What's the protocol for reducing, eliminating hyperpigmentation? Um, you know, it's one of those things where some people have a ton of factors that are driving hyperpigmentation, and in that case, it's going to be, you know, take time. Um, if you have a diet that's very rich in like nuts and seeds and canola oil and soybean oil and things like that, those fats are literally oxidizing with the sun constantly. Your tissues are full of those fats. And so every time you come in contact with the sun or those fats are coming in contact with your body, which is hot, right? It's 98.6 degrees and it's oxygen rich. Those fats oxidize when it's those to heat, light, and oxygen. And so perfect storm, right? And so what, what you're seeing when you have hyperpigmentation or melasma, you're seeing literal lipofuscin or literal oxidation uh, occurring. This is true for liver spots, age spots, things like that. This is oxidation of polyunsaturated fats mixed with iron oftentimes. And so, you know, we all are pretty much iron toxic. We grew up on eating tons and tons of iron fortified foods and then mix those with polyunsaturated fats and we've got a recipe for lipofuscin, which is what you're seeing on your skin. Add estrogen to the mix and we've got a recipe for disaster, which is why a lot of times, you know, people don't realize that the birth control pill does cause melasma or hyperpigmentation. So, you know, it's one of those things where if you have a ton of iron, you, you have iron toxicity, you have to like work, work on iron and you got to work on getting all of the cofactors that um, help iron to move. So vitamin C and magnesium and, and copper and things like that. And then if you have tons of polyunsaturated fat exposure, you might need to you know, wait years and years before you can fully get those things out of your tissues. Over time, you might see that improve by eating 
more saturated fats, more heat stable, oxygen stable, light stable fats over time and not eating as many PUFAs, eventually those will deplete from your tissues for the most part. Um, so, and things like vitamin E might help, things like, um, you know, aspirin might help, those types of things. But it really depends on the history. It depends on what's driving the melasma, the hyperpigmentation. Um, and until you get to that root cause, you know, you can do lots of topical things and things like that, but it's going to keep popping up until um, internally what's fixed. But you'll notice that um, I, I bring up the plant fats a lot because so many vegans and vegetarians are struggling with melasma and hyperpigmentation, interestingly enough, and it's because of their, their fat intake. Um, recently saw a pro omega-3 -er encouraging grass-fed beef because it's higher in omega-3 and fun fact and factory beef is higher in saturated fat. BS funny because we want the saturated fat. Uh, yeah, you know, it's what actually it's um, that's that's weird because that's that's um, kind of like an uninformed way of going. Uh, Grass-fed beef is not beneficial because it's higher in omega-3s. It's beneficial because the cows are eating what they're supposed to be eating, which is grass, and they have a lot more like conjugate, uh, conjugated linoleic acid. There's not as many toxins in their tissues because often conventional beef is going to be um, fed like gen genetically modified a glyphosate or pesticide heavy corn and soy. And so, you know, those cows are going to be really high in estrogen. They're going to be um, very sick. They're going to have really bad digestive issues, yada, yada, yada. And so, <laughs> you know, eating a sick cow is, uh, that has a very high omega-3, omega-6 polyunsaturated fat content in their tissues is really not a good idea, right? And so it's funny because he's saying that grass-fed beef is higher in omega-3. That's not the truth. Um, it's actually higher in, in high-quality saturated fats, and um, conventional raised beef is higher in polyunsaturated fats because what the cow's consuming is going to determine its fat content. And whatever fats it's consuming, that's what's in its fat. And so if a cow's eating tons of corn and soy, it's going to have tons of poof in its tissues. If a cow's eating grass, it's going to actually be a lot leaner, which is why grass-fed beef has a more gamey type taste, and uh, the, the fats that are in it are going to be a lot less toxic. So it's, uh, <laughs> it's not an informed um, educational uh, video or promotion. It's, people are really confused. <laughs> Thoughts on vitamin E apply topically for hirsutism, even on stomach. Personally, I see only good things with a vitamin E applied topically um, from things like uh, helping with fibrocystic breasts to cysts to anything that's um, being driven by estrogen in the tissues. A lot of people see benefits from applying vitamin E. So um, I, I, I don't know necessarily for hirsutism, but I don't think it, um, I don't see why it wouldn't be something to try. In general, would you recommend taking a probiotic daily or is it more of a temporary solution? Um, personally, probiotics do a lot of damage depending on what types you're taking. There are really good ones out there and there are actually really damaging ones. And a lot of people think like, oh, I'm taking a probiotic so I'm covering all my bases. And in reality, they're actually causing like histamine issues and tons and tons of gut issues. So just because a probiotic is made by a company that charges $70 or has a huge CFU count, it actually means little to nothing. Um, you really are should be very concerned with the strains you're intaking and if you have no idea what strains you're taking or what they do, you should cease your probiotic immediately. Um, personally, spore-based probiotics are going to be uh, very high quality probiotics because they have an antibiotic potential. A lot of this hoopla, um, people saying, oh, good bacteria and bad bacteria, we need to stop this. There's no such thing as good bacteria and bad bacteria. There are bacteria that are going to have more beneficial, um, uh, beneficial, I guess, um, tendencies for you. So they might create you with vitamins. They might create you minerals. They might keep your your metabolism a little bit more healthy. They might help you uh, tolerate carbohydrates. But even that type of bacteria in high amounts is going to be a problem, right? We need our bacteria kept in check. That's more like it. It's not good. It's not bad. It's just about an ecosystem. And so spore-based probiotics have an antibiotic uh, potential, meaning that they kind of act as like these little police officers and keep everything in check in your digestive tract and can completely kind of shift the balance or the ecosystem of your microbiome. And so um, depending on if you have gut issues or not, some people have really bad gut issues that continue are, are continuing 
It might need to be on a spore-based probiotic for six months to a year to really shift things. Some people just maybe need a little maintenance for like a couple of months and that's fine. Some people uh, don't need them at all. So it's just one of those things where it just depends on somebody's um, individual like individual what's going on in their digestive tract. But um, personally, I don't recommend doing probiotics daily unless you're taking a, a, a high quality one that you actually know what you're taking. Um, you don't wanna just be putting a bunch of random strains of bacteria in your digestive tract, it's not a good idea. What are your thoughts on matcha powder versus coffee? Personally, I react better to matcha, but I notice you drink coffee primarily, does it matter? Um, I don't necessarily love matcha because it's very high in fluoride. Um, green tea leaves are naturally high in fluoride, and so they can have a thyroid suppressive effect. Now, this is not always, this is always in context. You know, a lot of people are like, oh, matcha is so good for you, and so they go and drink like three cups a day, and then their temps and pulses lower, and their thyroid's really struggling, and it's displacing iodine, because because remember, fluoride is a halide, and so fluoride, chlorine, bromide, bromide, um, those will all displace iodine in the cell and kind of take up the iodine receptor. They all look similar to the body, so um, that halide will come in like fluoride and take up residence on the iodine receptor, and then your body can't make thyroid hormone from iodine anymore. So um, I don't like high amounts of fluoride coming in the body, whether that's drinking tap water or... Um, uh, doing tons and tons of matcha. Um, but it does have L-theanine in it, which is an anti, it, it kind of blocks serotonin, which lowers estrogen. So a lot of people do feel better on L-theanine or L-theanine rich things. Um, but yeah, I, I think um, matcha is something where it just needs to be observed in context. If it's not organic, it shouldn't be consumed because there, there'll be high pesticide content. Um, and you know, if you have thyroid problems, it might cause worse thyroid problems, but you always want to just pay attention. And that's why tracking your temps and pulses is such a good idea because you know if something's affecting you right away. Um, let's see, what exactly can a GI map show? Overgrowth bacteria in the gut, right? Yeah, a GI map, you know, no stool test is going to be perfect and it's not going to tell you a lot of things. I, I don't love running stool tests unless people just have so, such bad gut issues that they, you know, we can't make a dent in them um, because it's going to show you, you know, I guess a good idea of what strains of bacteria you're dealing with. If you have like a lot of methane producing bacteria, you possibly have small intestinal bacteria overgrowth. It's going to tell you your beta glucuronidase levels. So it tells you if you're making a ton of this um, enzyme that's going to reactivate estrogen in the gut, which is helpful. It shows you like your elastase levels. Um, so that's going to be a factor in like if you have enough stomach acid, enough digestive enzymes, enough um, bile, you know, enough good gallbladder flow. So it does tell you a lot of factors. It gives me a lot of markers. It will tell me if somebody has like protozoal parasites. Um, it tells me if um, there's like overgrowth of bacteria. It tests for like lots of strains of E. coli and things like that. But personally, I don't like running them because they're very expensive and they're not that accurate. I mean, they're accurate enough, but they're not that accurate. There's a lot of practitioners that are like, oh my God, they're so accurate. And I'm like, you know, it's one of the most accurate stool tests and it's still not really too accurate, you know, and it, and it kind of freaks people out because there's all these like overgrowths of bacteria, bright, bright red, and everyone's like, oh my God, we got to kill and destroy. And so a lot of people will go in with tons and tons of like antibiotics or tons and tons of antibiotic herbs. And then they literally wipe out their whole microbiome and now they struggle with like long-term constipation or they've created more gut issues for themselves. So I like the GI map to collect data and to collect information on people who are just having a really hard time getting over the hump of their digestive issues. It's going to tell you a lot, but um, it, it sometimes doesn't, doesn't help that much. Tried to use clary sage oil to get my cycle back on track after 14 years of birth control. Thoughts, can essential oils be estrogenic? Um, most essential oils are estrogenic, which is why I don't really like using them topically. They can really hurt the thyroid, especially if they're not put in, into a carrier oil because they're very rich in phenols. Um, that's not to say that they're not effective because they are and to be used with responsibility and used responsibly, they can be very, very powerful. But I don't think, um, you know, if, if, 
you're not getting your cycle 14 years of after 14 years of birth control clary sage oil is not going to be powerful enough to bring it back um that you know birth control is going to drive um you know possible thyroid issues it can drive lots of nutrient deficiencies and all of those things are going to affect the cycle so those are things that i would personally explore if i was struggling with not getting my cycle back after um, birth control over just trying to find like a quick fix remedy by the way, you are literally one of the most educated people and always back everything you say with research and your own personal results. Wouldn't listen to anyone else in the whole health industry than you. <laughs> Thank you. I really appreciate that. You know, I, I, I try to do my best and try to stay humble and understand that there's always more to learn. I don't know everything. I honestly don't. I, I don't even have... I haven't even, you know, put a dent in it, um, but I just try to do my best to observe and I always am accepting that I could be wrong, which helps me continue my research and, and education. How do you explain to someone who has cystic acne but won't give up being vegan what the problem is? <laughs> um, sometimes you just have to let it go. Like people want to struggle, they're going to struggle and sometimes they will not let it go. Um, but I, uh, I do recommend watching my like vegan or plant-based uh, highlight story. I have a story highlight that I talked about this. I talked about how veganism or being plant-based can impair detoxification um, because it's very low in sulfur. It's a very uh, low zinc diet and it's very high in copper um, and copper from the soil, which is not necessarily like a, a good thing. Um, so there's really a lot of different caveats to, to what could be driving issues, but Usually I boiled it down to not enough bioavailable protein. Only animal protein is bioavailable. Things that have eyes <laughs> are gonna be the most bioavailable. And then um, also the just lack of taurine. There's very little taurine in a vegan diet. I mean, really none at all. And so you're gonna have a very difficult time um, with creating bile, which is uh, that, that kind of liquid that comes from the gallbladder that keeps your small intestine sterile and helps you digest fats properly. And so if you're not creating bile, you're not moving estrogen out of your body, you're not moving uh, toxins out of your body properly or efficiently, and your whole system is going to show it. And so, um, yeah, I would, I would watch my highlight story and maybe like write down a few points that you could go over with them. But at the end of the day, when it comes to diet and nutrition, some people's diet is their religion, right? It's not their, it's not just their nutrition it's their whole life it's their identity and so it can take some time for someone to get to a point like sometimes they have to be absolutely miserable before they have to actually view themselves and kind of practice some self-awareness and say like is this truly my nutrition or is this my whole life is this my identity and so often veganism is somebody's identity like I'm not a murderer I don't eat you know I don't eat animals and it's like they've literally gotten like so worked up over their their cause that they can't let it go and so sometimes you just have to let them figure it out for themselves um why do people say to avoid dairy with Hashimoto's I don't know I just I think it's just a lack of education a lack of understanding what's actually driving Hashimoto's Hashimoto's is just a state of being you know I used to have Hashimoto's which just meant I had like high TPO antibodies and it was because my whole body was inflamed and my thyroid was a problem and it wasn't it was very much struggling and so my body had created the antibodies against that tissue to, to point to the inflammation and so I had to lower inflammation in my body and I really thought going dairy free was going to be the thing that lowered inflammation but no it didn't <laughs> in fact it made it worse so um, the thing that I found was the most successful in lowering inflammation in my body was getting my gut issues figured out getting my mineral deficiencies and my mineral issues figured out stop eating so many damn cruciferous vegetables and leafy greens and nuts and seeds um, that were just irritating my gut and creating endotoxins and after endotoxin, after endotoxin, burdening my liver, causing blood sugar issues. Um, so those are kind of the things that helped me limit inflammation the most and just eating more carbs in general. I was so stressed out constantly and I didn't realize that that was in part causing me so much inflammation. I had a saliva test on, on the suggested day for a hormone checking. I said high testosterone, low progesterone, and normal estrogen, but I've suffered from estrogen symptoms, not sure how. You know, saliva tests are not that accurate for uh, horm testing hormones anyways, but um, estrogen is one of those things that is tricky because a lot of people don't realize that 
the, the bloodstream is just a highway for hormones. Even saliva is going to just kind of be a snapshot in time. It does not measure how much estrogen is in your tissues or your organs. And so oftentimes you're going to have a very difficult time understanding how estrogen dominant you are. It, it's what I would call estrogen accumulation. And then add low progesterone on top of that and you're not mobilizing estrogen out of your tissues or your organs at all because to actually mobilize and detoxify estrogen, it requires two things. It requires proper metabolic function or thyroid function, and it requires progesterone. And if you have low progesterone, you're not mobilizing um, estrogen properly. And then on top of it, most likely if you have low progesterone, your thyroid function is gonna struggle because progesterone is very thyroid supportive. And so, you know, it's just one of those things where I usually, you know, if somebody has estrogen dominant symptoms and estrogen excess symptoms, it's usually better to go by symptoms than to go by a test because obviously your body trumps a test. Speaking of lymph, my husband has a swollen lymph node that's painful near his ear. Any tips? Oregano oil. Um, gua sha or gua sha um, scraping, you know, just actually like um, moving that lymph tissue. A lot of times people are super stressed out and so they have a lot of like trigger points and like a bundled up fascia in the neck and the upper shoulders. And so just by doing body work like scraping or myofascial release, um, trigger point therapy can really help the lymph nodes actually drain. Um, but if that's not enough, then and there are like lymph supportive essential oil blends, which I like to actually mix with um, like coconut oil or something like that and actually rub on and then do like some lymphatic drainage. But yeah, usually if it's like near the ear, you can do lymphatic drainage techniques all day long. Um, a lot of people actually like doing castor oil packs as well on the lymph nodes. Um, I, I've never done that. I've only used like a lymph um, drainage essential oil and gua sha and scraping, but um, it, it and that tends to do the trick. How do you recommend consuming naked casein powder? Do you also recommend naked whey differences? I don't like whey protein for the most part um, because it's very constipating and it also is a precursor. It's very rich in L-tryptophan, so it's going to turn into serotonin and cause all types of estrogen issues. So I prefer casein because it's anti-stress, anti-cortisol, and it tends to be digested a lot better. Um, and casein, I just recommend like throwing it in a smoothie, throwing it in shakes. I'll do like this like coffee drink frappuccino thing where I throw it in for like a snack and it's literally just like coffee ice cubes, casein, milk, and uh, like some, some type of sugar or sweetener. Um, I, you can bake it, like you can put it in brownies, cookies, bars, whatever you want uh, in that regard. Like you can put it in fudge, you can really put it in just about anything. Um, you can mix it in like your oatmeal, you can mix it in your yogurt, like you can, you can mix it into anything, use it just like a protein powder. What does it mean if HCL enzymes, one pill taken with protein, causes major bloat? Oftentimes, hydrochloric acid is going to be very antibacterial, antiviral, antiparasitic. So, you know, people have to remember that if they're taking hydrochloric acid and they're st starting to build their stomach acid up, most likely once the, because remember, your, your food mixes with the hydrochloric acid in the stomach, right? Your stomach's kind of like this muscle. It's like pulverizing your food, turning it into liquid. And then once that hydrochloric acid chyme, um, so it's acid and your food has really broken down, that liquid drops into the top of the small intestine where it's going to be neutralized. But uh, the stomach acid, if you have like lots of bacterial overgrowth up at the top of your small intestine or you have bacterial overgrowth in general or H. pylori or things like that, any type of bacterial overgrowth, that HCL is going to be antibacterial, antiviral, antiparasitic. And so it's going to start to kill things. And so I have seen people that start to build their stomach acid up and they actually go through this die off reaction where, you know, um, bacteria starts to die and think, you know, they're bloated, they're gassy. Anytime bacteria dies, it's going to cause bloat. It's going to off gas. And so um, sometimes just like a, an intestinal massage to really move the air out can be helpful. Um, but it shouldn't cause any discomfort. Like if it causes burning hydrochloric acid, it's not a good idea. But if it's just killing bacteria, then sometimes it's just kind of like you have to go through a week or two of it um, before it kind of subsides or you become less bloated. Starting to eat meat again after 20 years. Woohoo! Wow, that is a long time. Uh, I have a few bites every other day. If I drink bone broth, I get bloated, which is not something I experience otherwise. Is this histamine? Most likely, it could just be a sign of like low stomach acid. Um, and, you know, 
any time someone's not eaten meat for any amount of time, 20 years is a long time, you're gonna have really low stomach acid. And so um, it's gonna be a really bumpy ride at first, and it could be histamine if you're getting other histamine reactions like hives or things like that. But if it's if you're not getting any other histamine reaction, you're just getting bloated, it could just be that uh, it's actually doing some work. So it's increasing your stomach acid. It could be the glycine um, that's like helping your liver. Like it could be some, some he I call it healing reactions or healing work. Sometimes it gets a little more uncomfortable before things get better. But the way that you kind of know if it's a healing reaction or if it's actually something bad is happening is it should slightly improve over time. And until it kind of subsides and goes away. If it continues to be the same amount of discomfort or continues to be uh, the same amount of symptoms and problems, then sometimes something's not working well for you. But some people do better just doing some type of like um, chicken stock or something at first before they move on to bone broth because bone broth is going to be a little bit higher in histamines. So doing some type of stock like chicken broth or chicken stock or something like that might be a better option to work yourself up. Some people actually do best on the on like organic non-toxic like bullion cubes um, which are really electrolyte rich which helps kind of build the stomach acid up. Um, if you can get your hands on those mixed in water and then working up to chicken broth and then chicken stock and then full on bone broth. It can take some time though. I'm about to do a bentonite clay mask now. Yay! Love bentonite clay masks. My brother is taking just uh, vitamin D from his doctor, but no vitamin K. Is it important if he's taking D to also take K? Yes, in my opinion, yes, because vitamin D is going to calcify the body. Remember, if you have a vitamin D deficiency, you have a magnesium deficiency. Vitamin D taken supplementally is most likely just going to cause calcification. Um, magnesium deficiency is what drives a vitamin uh, D deficiency. Besides coconut oil, grass-fed butter, and ghee, do you recommend avocado oil for cooking? Um, no, I just don't know why we would consume concentrated avocado fat. It's one thing to like eat an avocado, but another thing to concentrate its oil and, and eat that. Now, of course, like occasionally, um, for example, like I'll eat siete food, uh, like tortilla chips that are cooked in avocado oil. I would much prefer that over a tortilla chip cooking it, cooked in canola oil, but I'm not, not gonna make a habit of, uh, about cooking my food in avocado oil. Um, first of all, it's just not very sustainable. It's horrible for the environment. I mean, avocados are wiping out Mexico right now, and so it takes takes a ton of avocados to press um, uh, to press into a bottle of avocado oil. So I just do it out of like ethical and moral reasons, if nothing else, but it's also not that good for us. So it's just like two birds and one stone, you know, like um, let's stop being like consuming this unsustainable oil. And then also let's stop consuming this mono unsaturated fat in high amounts. Again, avocados are another thing. They're a whole food. You're not going to get like a concentrated source of oil, but if you're consuming tons and tons of avocado oil, it's most likely going to be a problem. So hard to know what brands to trust. What liver aiding supplements or brands do you recommend? I highly recommend going uh, in, in the link in my bio and downloading my liver detox guide. It has um, some really amazing uh, recommendations for supporting the liver. Any recommendations for constipation? I have candida and other digestive issues. Started to change my diet, stopped all high fiber veggies, added more fruits, but make me feel super brain fogged. Yeah, so when it comes to constipation and candida, it's mo mostly a metabolic issue. You know, I was somebody that struggled with horrible gut issues for such a long time, I was always super constipated, and therefore that gave me um, an overgrowth of bacteria and candida. Why? Because if food's moving through your digestive tract very, very slowly, the longer that it sits there, the more fermentation and the more uh, bacteria growth that will occur, and therefore the more brain fog, the more symptoms, etc., etc. It's not the candida's problem, it's not the bacteria's problem. We naturally are going to have yeast and uh, bacteria in our in our digestive tracts is the transit time that's the problem and oftentimes when people do a test a transit time test so you can eat beets you can do activated charcoal you can do chlorophyll something that's going to be really vibrantly colored you're going to find that you have a very slow transit time oftentimes it's like 72 hours or something like that of course there's overgrowth. So the ultimate goal is getting food moving through your digestive tract as quickly as possible, which will limit the amount of fermentation that occurs. And that's the most important thing we should be focused on. A lot of times we're focused on like killing candida and this and that. And it's like, nothing's gonna improve our symptoms overall until we get food moving quicker. I like aloe vera for this effect. I like cascara sagrada for this effect. I like um, getting magnesium levels up. A lot of times it's mineral deficiencies, um, like things like copper, uh, 
potassium, magnesium, all those deficiencies are going to cause a very slow bowel. So uh, those are things to kind of keep in mind. We can try to like kill and destroy the candida all day long, but it's just gonna be this never ending vicious cycle. Of course, things like raw carrot and spore-based probiotics and oregano oil are gonna help with those issues, but until we get our transit time up, it's just gonna be this vicious cycle. What supplements do you recommend for PCOS sufferers? I don't really uh, recommend like a blanket for, for people who have PCOS because everyone with PCOS is so different. Like this person that has PCOS is being driven by completely different issues than this person. But generally it's being driven by stress and it's being driven by um, estrogen dominance. So uh, things that are gonna get uh, pr progesterone up and help with estrogen detox are gonna be the most important. So first of all, making sure we're getting a plenty of protein. Diet's really everything in regards to PCOS and unless you nail down your diet, supplements are gonna be absolutely Absolutely useless. Once you've nailed down your diet, things like grass-fed beef liver, oysters, vitamin E, magnesium, um, like sodium, potassium, vitamin C can all be very, very supportive. Um, but until you nail down diet, it's not going to really make a huge difference. Should you take betaine HCL with smoothies with beef protein powder? Um, it just kind of depends. I personally find that that gives me like the heartburn of death. Um, so I, I don't do stuff like that, but some people have really low stomach acid, so it doesn't seem to bother them. I think it just is like a, a, um, a situational basis, but technically like hydrochloric acid is recommended for like more protein rich meals. Can you talk about night sweats? Thinking it's hormonal, but I'm in my 20s. Yeah, I mean, people can have night sweats in their 20s. Um, night sweats are gonna be driven by adrenaline, cortisol, estrogen, um, and low progesterone, which is pretty common when you're in your 20s nowadays. Um, so, you know, the goal would be to balance blood sugar. Are you eating every three hours? Are you eating protein, carb, and a little bit of fat every three hours? Um, are you eating a bedtime snack 30 minutes before you go to bed? Something like maybe a cup of haagen -Dazs or some type of ice cream that doesn't have any additives or nasties in it, like xanthan gum or locust bean gum or something like that. And then um, mixing some like collagen into that, some protein into that. So we got a little bit of fat, we've got some carbs, sugar, and we've got some protein. And what that's gonna do is keep our body really stable throughout the night. Oftentimes night sweats are happening because of either fault, um, follicle stimulating hormone FSH which is a vasodilator meaning that it opens up our capillaries and brings blood to the surface which is kind of that hot flash right it's like heat and then all of a sudden it's like I'm hot and that's usually going to be driven by estrogen issues and low progesterone so we want to get our blood sugar balanced but um, sometimes night sweats can also be caused by adrenaline and cortisol which is just a stress hormone so simply by eating a bedtime snack before bed that's going to lower cortisol lower adrenaline um, a lot of women are under eating and so that's causing a problem you you know, if you're eating less than 1500 calories, that's about the amount of calories recommended for a four year old little girl. So, um, your body's starving and it's having to constantly compensate. So, um, you know, there's a lot of factors going into night sweats, and night sweats are probably a bigger, a symptom of a way bigger problem that's happening beneath the surface. And it's your body saying, like, hey, hey, like over here. You know, so uh, we always, if we're having symptoms, those are usually screams. Our body's saying like, hi, um, I need some, some attention. Can you continue sharing what you eat? We've been so taught to eat all the greens and cruciferous vegetables. Yeah, of course. I mean, very simply, I always focus on just getting a protein and a carb at every single meal. And yeah, I will be happy to share. You know, I used to eat like tons of cruciferous vegetables and tons of leafy greens, like salad for a huge salad, like this big bowl of salad for lunch every day with like sardines or something like that. And I never like, my gut issues never improved. My health really like, it got better, of course. Like I went from a standard American diet to that. So of course I had improvements, but I never felt amazing. Um, and my, I was always so bloated. <laughs> And now I'm definitely not bloated and I feel a lot better. So, um, you know, I am just one of many testimonies that know <laughs> that uh, the less veggies is usually the better. Can you work with women who are breastfeeding? Oh, yeah, of course. Um, sim I just simply take an approach of, um, you know, making sure that you're having enough fuel to, to function and then and kind of balance back to normal as much as possible. Every breastfeeding woman's a little different. So some women haven't started their cycle again. And so I just kind of have you pay attention to your temps and pulses, see how you're doing. Um, as you go back to cycling, we want to keep an eye on progesterone, right? Because we want to make sure like you're, you're making progesterone enough. And usually that has to do with just making sure that 
that during breastfeeding you're getting enough nutrients. Oftentimes your calorie needs go up about 300 to 500 calories. And then you're also going to need lots of iodine um, because iodine is the building block of the breast milk and vitamin E and things like that. So there are certain nutrients that you just need a high amount. So I focus on those things, make sure you're getting enough. And usually, um, usually that just means you're going to go back to balance a lot more once you're done breastfeeding a lot faster. What might be causing itchy skin, hives, and rashes all the time, not tied to any food allergies? Um, it could be a lot of things. Magnesium deficiency, copper deficiency. Um, it could be like high histamine issues from eating the wrong things. And I'm not talking like a lot of people are like, oh, I eat really healthy. And I'm like, I'm not talking about like eating healthy. I'm talking about eating the right things. A lot of healthy foods in our modern day culture are not what our body deems as healthy foods. They're not biological foods. Um, so... I don't know what's causing those things. I would have to like know what's going on with you, what your history is, all those types of things um, before I could even guess what's going on. Hi Jess, have you heard of biotherapeutic drainage for liver detox? I was suggested it by a functional doctor. I haven't really heard that. Is it just like um, pressure on the gallbladder? Like I do that myself, like um, some type of like liver and, and gallbladder massage, making sure there's no trigger points in that area. Um, but I've never heard of like biotherapeutic drainage. I'm actually interested in that. It's kind of, it sounds kind of cool. Whenever you guys mention something, I always write it down because I want to know <laughs> what, what is that? I've actually learned so much from you guys. Like you'll mention something like in passing and I'll be like, oh, I want to know what that is. And then I, I integrate it. And it ends up being um, very, very good. Um, where is a good place to start when looking for unbiased studies on nutrition and everything in that realm? Um, you're always, you're always going to have un, uh, biased studies. There's always going to be a bias to science. Science is not, uh, is not unbiased. I, I, I hate to say this to you guys. I hate to burst your bubble, but science always has an agenda. Always. So you always want to go into every study understanding who is trying to push their agenda. Now you can get great information, very great information from a study. However, if I know it's being tweaked a certain way, I'm like, okay, I I'm taking a more unbiased point of view. You're always, you know, I, I hate this show me the research study culture, you guys. Like if you're someone that says that to, to other people, stop doing that. If you're like, show me the study, show me the study. Because studies are just one tiny little inkest grain of sand on the whole beach. And if you're constantly concerned with showing showing the study or seeing the study, you're missing a huge a huge uh, picture because studies do not uh, always take your biology into account, your biochemistry or your physiology. So what I recommend you guys do is first understand your physiology, understand your biology, understand those things first, so that when you go and look at a study, you can easily say BS. Or you can easily say, oh, that makes sense because I know what cortisol is or I know what adrenaline is or I know what that enzyme is or I know this or I know that. You can take from that study what actually applies to your physiology. Oftentimes people are, are missing that connection. They are not taking research and applying it to physiology because they simply don't know physiology. They don't know anything about it. All they know is, well, this research study said this is good for me. And I'm like, well, this research study said that same thing is horrible for you. So what is it? And if you look at your physiology and you, you can easily determine you know, like for example, fish oil is a huge, huge example. There's 20,000 studies that say fish oil is amazing for you and so good for heart health and so, you know, anti-inflammatory. However, what about the ones on um, fish oil being immunosuppressive? Or how about the fact that they used fish oil as chemo in the 1940s? Or what about the fact that fish taking fish oil causes something called, uh, has a, as a byproduct called acrolein? Go do research on acrolein. Oh, 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 wait, I thought fish oil was good for me. It, I didn't realize it caused cancer. Wait, what? It causes diabetes? Because acrolein is a horrible thing that you don't want hap happening to your body but acrolein is produced when you take fish oil. There's, there, that's what's happening. So you have to kind of understand um, your physiology. And I would say there's really no unbiased research out there. Um, you kind of have to take research for what it is and kind of filter through. And that's like the worst part. But I really do like starting with Ray P. I think Ray P is a great foundation because he understands hormones. He's so so whip smart about hormones and he has done so much research he you guys should look at his articles he has hundreds of research studies hundreds 
uh, attached. He always is backed by research. And that is a great place to start because you can start to follow the trail. You can start to make connections in your brain for yourself. And that's where um, I've really seen a lot of progress in my education um, by, by really starting with his research and then doing my own research based on that. But there is a great website called Functional Performance Systems, and his blog is really cool because he has compiled so much research there um, based on uh, good information. And so you can get a lot of uh, really good research studies from that website as well. Are cherry angiomas lipofuscin? I'm not sure. I, I, I'm not really sure what those are, but I'm wondering... Um, if they're, they could be like inflammation related. I need to look at a picture of that. Yeah, I don't know. Um, that's a, that's a long way of me saying I have no idea. I bought whole food vitamin C powder. I heard it's best to take this throughout the day. How do you like to take what whole food vitamin C? Personally, I take it in the morning, um, in my adrenal cocktail that has some sodium and potassium in it, and then the whole foods vitamin C. Um, I'll also add it if I'm making like a smoothie or something, but oftentimes I'm taking it in the morning right when I wake up. Was suggested seed cycling, but I know you don't like seeds. What do you suggest otherwise? Just actually supporting your body. Um, I don't think like you, we need to eat a seed every day to regulate our cycle. Personally, I don't like seed cycling. I think seeds are not a, an ancestral food. They're not a part of like a, a biological or physiologically supportive diet. Like I just don't understand. It's just very much a fad. Um, but uh, I don't really recommend anything instead. I just... Uh, I recommend continuing to support your body. Your opinion on healing acne star acne scars. Um, vitamin E and progesterone are very skin supportive. Remember that sugar is also a humectant. So anything that's going to be like sugar rich. So like for example, raw honey um, is going to be very very healing for for scars. That's why um, you know honey has been used on burn wounds or like any type of wound. Um, and you know like for example during the Civil War they used to pack wounds with sugar um, because it's very antibacterial, but it's also humectant, so it increases is healing. So um, raw honey and then um, vitamin E with progesterone oil is tends to be really, really uh, supportive. I personally just like um, using progesterone and vitamin E uh, for just like, um, like glowy, very dewy, like youthful looking skin. Can you tell us your experience with red light therapy? Yeah, I love red light therapy. I think it's a really great support. I don't think it's like the first thing we need to do in our health journey, but it can definitely be very, very um, supportive. It helps the mitochondria produce a little bit more ATP. It can increase CO2 levels, which is always anti-stress. So overall, like I really like red light therapy and think it can be very supportive um, in like if you have a holistic kind of nutrition and lifestyle plan. If dairy leads to acne, is that just because the gut needs repair? It was suggested an elimination diet to see what's causing acne. Hope it isn't the dairy, but I suspect it is. Oftentimes, dairy is going to cause, um, can, can drive acne symptoms. I always like to say it the proper way because it's not dairy causing acne. It's dairy irritating the thing that's causing acne. Um, oftentimes, people are eating so many foods that are irritating their digestive tract, like nuts, seeds, uh, le leafy greens, and cruciferous vegetables in high amounts. And then they, uh, or like xanthan gum or lots of like gums and additives. And then they eat dairy and the dairy, uh, causes acne for them and so they're like oh it's the dairy and I'm like well it's actually all those other foods that are irritating your gut and then when you eat the dairy it's it's kind of um, bringing about those symptoms so you know people can totally cut dairy if it's causing symptoms but just know that even if your acne goes away there's still a problem and if you eat dairy again and it brings up acne then there's the problem wasn't fixed it just was suppressed um but yeah, it's usually the gut needs repair. There's there's some uh, usually intestinal permeability going on, so those dairy proteins are leaking into the digestive tract, and on top of it, the lactose is not being broken down properly because it's it's difficult for the body to create lactase enzymes um, in the small intestine if the small intestine is very irritated or we have low T3 or low progesterone. I'd really like periods and have been getting dizzy during my periods. Should I be concerned? It has happened for a couple of months now. Um, yeah, I would be concerned. Um, yeah, you, you want like a good flow. You don't want your period to be too heavy. You don't want it to be too light. Um, also like, um, you don't want to be dizzy during your period. I had to get a CT scan and have been so bummed that I was exposed to so much radiation. Is there any way to help my body recover quickly? 
um, usually radiation can be damaging because of it, it, it increases estrogen and it increases serotonin very quickly, and it, that can lower progesterone. So just making sure you're focusing on progesterone, focusing on the thyroid, taking your temps and pulses, um, and just overall like uh, encouraging estrogen detoxification from the digestive tract is usually a great way to uh, like recover. Um, like usually if I'm going to go through like an airplane radiation machine or something like that, I always make sure my blood sugar is really high because that's a great way to support your thyroid. Like if you make sure you drink a Coke or you drink, um, a, a cane sugar Coke, I should say, not a high fructose corn syrup one or like a ton of orange juice or make sure you have a full meal in you before you get exposed to radiation. And then, um, Afterwards, I usually will eat a raw carrot right away and take some activated charcoal to make sure that any um, increase in serotonin or estrogen is kind of being taken care of. And I try to, of course, avoid radiation when, when possible, but you can't, you don't live in a perfect world, you know? This might be a dumb question, but how do you know the difference between a histamine reaction to food and just poor gut health, low stomach acid, etc.? Um, it's not a dumb question because they kind of are connected. Like a lot of people get really obsessed with histamines and like, yeah, histamine issues usually flare up when you eat histamine rich foods. So that would look like wine, cheese, um, bone broth sometimes, gelatin, collagen, um, uh, shellfish, and things like that. You get like really bad, like very immediate symptoms. There can sometimes be hives, sometimes bloating, sometimes digestive upset. You get really bad allergies, congestion, that type of thing. But very specific histamine rich foods. Whereas gut health is just gonna be like, you're constantly have low grade bloating, constantly poor digestion, constipated, diarrhea. Like you just constantly have digestive issues regardless of what it is that you eat. Like some foods might flare that up more than others, but you, you're, your gut never feels quite right. And usually people that have gut issues have histamine issues. So it's one of those things where if you have histamine issues, you have gut issues. Thoughts on lemon water first thing in the morning? Um, I like it. I think it can be very supportive. Um, personally, I like to do something with sugar right in the morning to actually like lower my stress response. So I prefer like something like orange juice. Um, but um, I don't see why lemon water would be, there's any problem with it. I've been taking Progest-E for past two months. The last month consistently, my bleed is much less, if non-existent, waiting to see how many days ago I take Progest-E for. Um, yeah, I don't, uh, uh, what's the question though? Um, you know, sometimes implementing progesterone, especially too much progesterone, can lighten our flow. Like we don't wanna, you know, to take too much and lighten our flow up. Because remember, progesterone thins the uterine lining, whereas estrogen is gonna thicken the uterine lining. So sometimes if you don't need progesterone or you're taking too much, you'll find that it um, lightens up the period too much. Can you give tips for improving sleep? Yeah, you know, don't drink coffee after 2 p.m. Um, unless you have like a full meal and you, you drink it with sugar. Um, if your sleep sucks, you're probably not getting a lot of sunlight during the day or sunlight right when you wake up. You want to make sure you're getting exposed to natural sunlight um, at least 30 minutes a day. Um, get off your phone for about two hours before you go to bed. And if you're going to be exposed to any screens, wear blue blocking glasses um, to make sure you're blocking that blue light. Um, and then turn off your Wi-Fi. Um, if you're you know close to a bunch of EMFs, you're going to kind of feel like really, um, I guess, kind of supercharged. And when it comes to magnesium, like a lot of people are deficient in magnesium, which is why they're not sleeping well. So something as simple as taking like an Epsom salt bath or magnesium flake bath or doing like magnesium chloride on the skin, which is just like magnesium oil spray. You can get that on Amazon um, or taking magnesium can be really helpful in restoring sleep. But if sleep continues to suck, it's usually a progesterone issue, especially if it's the, the last two weeks of your cycle. If your sleep gets particularly bad the last two weeks of your cycle or leading up to your period, then that's usually a sign of low progesterone because progesterone does support healthy sleep. I had high LH on day three of the cycle. I'm also low in estrogen and progesterone, yet I'm estrogen dominant. Could this be PCOS? Um, I mean, it's possible, but, um, you know, uh, if you got your, 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 your hormones tested 
on day three of the cycle, how do you know that you're low in estrogen or progesterone? Um, that would be my question. A lot of people don't realize they have to get their progesterone tested five to seven days after they ovulate. And estrogen uh, is very low, if non-existent, um, at the first part of your period or day three of the cycle. So the best time to test estrogen is right before we ovulate. Oftentimes women who think they're, they have low estrogen are actually estrogen dominant when they test during that time. How would I know if there's mold in my apartment? Could it cause fatigue and dizziness? Um, it's possible. Um, if you have any leaks, if there's water in the roof, um, if you, like, when it rains, you get water in the walls, um, if uh, there's, like, you know, water leaking under the sink or in the bathrooms or the bathrooms don't have fans or windows, you know, anything that's going to, like, proliferate mold growth, those are things you would want to maybe think about. Hi Jess, in your experience, what could be a cause for air hunger, shortness of breath on and off? Um, usually low CO2 and high oxygen, so or or maybe like no oxygenation. I don't know what your workout routine is, but a lot of people do tons of strength training and they don't do any body work, no myofascial release, no trigger point therapy, nothing to actually support um, blood flow, and so their tissues aren't getting any oxygen. Um, an easy way to remedy that is just doing myofascial release, so like trigger point therapy, foam rolling, things like that, and then doing paper bag breathing, so breathing in some CO2 until it's uncomfortable. Like you don't want to like force yourself to breathe into a paper bag, but usually you can do it for about two minutes before it starts to be uncomfortable, and then take a break and then do it again. But that can really lower stress very well. Do you mind speaking on natural treatments of PCOS? I feel like carbs are so demonized and I don't know what to do and can't find anything else that helps. Yeah, PCOS is such a layered issue. I highly recommend listening to my uh, interview on Mito Life Radio. Uh, we discussed this in detail. All right, guys, I'm being cut off. I'll go live again in a second.